The Story of Aoyagi A Japanese Ghost Story from Kwaiden Stories and Studies of Strange Things by Lafcadio Hearn, 1904 In the era of Bumie, 1469-1486, there was a young samurai called Tomotada in the service of Hatakiyama Yoshimune, the lord of Noto. Tomotada was a native of Ikizen, but at an early age he had been taken as page into the palace of the daimyo of Noto and had been educated under the supervision of that prince for the profession of arms. As he grew up, he proved himself both a good scholar and a good soldier, and continued to enjoy the favor of his prince. Being gifted with an amiable character, a winning address, and a very handsome person, he was admired and much liked by his samurai comrades. When Tomotaro was about 20 years old, he was sent upon a private mission to Hosokawa Masamoto, the great daimyo of Kyoto, a kinsman of Hatekeyama Yoshimone. Having been ordered to journey through Ikazen, the youth requested and obtained permission to pay a visit on the way to his widowed mother. It was the coldest period of the year when he started, and though mounted upon a powerful horse, he found himself obliged to proceed slowly. The road which he followed passed through a mountain district where the settlements were few and far between, and on the second day of his journey, after a weary ride of hours, he was dismayed to find that he could not reach his intended halting place until late in the night. He had reason to be anxious for a heavy snowstorm came on with an intensely cold wind, and the horse showed signs of exhaustion. But in that trying moment, Tomotada unexpectedly perceived the thatched room of a cottage on the summit of a near hill, where willow trees were growing. With difficulty, he urged his tired animal to the dwelling, and he loudly knocked upon the storm doors, which had been closed against the wind. An old woman opened them and cried out compassionately at the sight of the handsome stranger. Ah, how pitiful, a young gentleman, traveling alone in such weather, deign, young master, to enter. Tomotada dismounted and, after leading his horse to a shed in the rear, entered the cottage, where he saw an old man and a girl warming themselves by a fire of bamboo splints. They respectfully invited him to approach the fire, and the old folks then proceeded to warm some rice wine and to prepare some food for the traveler whom they ventured to question in regard to his journey. Meanwhile, the young girl disappeared behind a screen. Tomatata had observed with astonishment that she was extremely beautiful, though her attire was of the most wretched kind and her long, loose hair in disorder. He wondered that so handsome a girl should be living in such a miserable and lonely place. The old man said to him, Honored sir, the next village is far and the snow is falling thickly. The wind is piercing and the road is very bad. Therefore, to proceed further this night would probably be dangerous. Although this hovel is unworthy of your presence, and although we have not comfort to offer, perhaps it would be safer to remain tonight under this miserable roof. We would take good care of your horse." Tomotada accepted this humble proposal, secretly glad of the chance thus afforded him to see more of the young girl. Presently a coarse but ample meal was set before him, and the girl came from behind the screen to serve the wine. She was now reclad, but in a rough, cleanly robe of homespun, and her long, loose hair had been neatly combed and smoothed. As she bent forward to fill his cup, Tomotada was amazed to perceive that she was incomparably more beautiful than any woman whom he had ever before seen, and there was a grace about her every motion that astonished him. But the elders began to apologize for her, saying, Sir, our daughter, Aoyagi, has been brought up here in the mountains, almost alone, and she knows nothing of gentle service. We pray that you will pardon her stupidity and her ignorance. Tomotada protested that he deemed himself lucky to be waited upon so comely a maiden. 
He could not turn his eyes away from her, though he saw that his admiring gaze made her blush, and he left the wine and food untasted before him. The mother said, Kind sir, we very much hope that you will try to eat and drink a little, though our peasant fare is of the worst, as you must have been chilled by that piercing wind. Then, to please the old folks, Tomotada ate and drank as he could, but the charm of the blushing girl still grew upon him. He talked with her and found that her speech was as sweet as her face, brought up in the mountains as she might have been, but in that case her parents must at some time have been persons of high degree, for she spoke and moved like a damsel of rank. Suddenly he addressed her with a poem, which was also a question inspired by the delight of his heart. Tadzunetsuru, hana ka tote koso, haiwo kurase, akinu ni oturu, akane sasuran. Being on my way to pay a visit, I found that which I took to be a flower, therefore here I spend the day. Why, in that time before dawn, the dawn blush tint should glow? That indeed, I know not. Without a moment's hesitation, she answered him in these verses. Izuro hino, hono miku iro wo, waga sode ni, sutsu mapo asumo, kimiya tomoran. If with my sleeve I hid the faint of the dawning sun, then perhaps in the morning my lord will remain. Then Tomotada knew that she accepted his admiration, and he was scarcely less surprised by the art which she had uttered her feelings in verse, then delighted the assurance which the verses conveyed. He was now certain that in all of this world he could not hope to meet, much less to win, a girl more beautiful and witty than this rustic maid before him, and a voice in his heart seemed to cry out urgently, Take the luck the gods have put in your way. In short, he was bewitched, bewitched to such a degree that, without further preliminary, he asked the old people to give him their daughter in marriage, telling them at the same time his name and lineage, his rank in the train of the Lord of Noto. They bowed before him with many exclamations of grateful astonishment. But after some moments of apparent hesitation, the father replied, Honored master, you are a person of high position and likely to rise to still higher things. Too great is the favor you deign to offer us. Indeed, the depth of our gratitude, therefore, is not to be spoken or measured. But this girl of ours, being a stupid country girl, of vulgar birth, with no training or teaching of any sort, it would be improper to let her become a wife of a noble samurai. Even to speak of such a matter is not right, but since you find the girl to your liking and have condescended to pardon her peasant manners and to overlook her great rudeness, we do gladly present her to you for a humble handmaid. Deign, therefore, to act hereafter in her regard according to your august pleasure. Ere morning the storm had passed and day broke through a cloudless east. Even if the sleeve of Aoyagi hid from her lover's eyes the rose blush of that dawn, he could no longer tarry. But neither could he resign himself to part with this girl. And when everything had been prepared for his journey, he thus addressed her parents. Though it may seem thankless to ask for more than I have already received, I must again beg you to give me your daughter for wife. It would be difficult for me to separate from her now, and as she is willing to accompany me, if you permit, I can take her with me as she is. If you will give her to me, I shall ever cherish you as parents. And in the meantime, please to accept this poor acknowledgement of your kindest hospitality. So saying, he placed before his humble host a purse of gold rio, but the old man, after many prostrations, gently pushed back the gift and said, Kind master, the gold would be of no use to us, and you will probably have need of it during your long, cold journey. Here we buy nothing, and we could not spend so much money upon ourselves, even if we wished. As for the girl, we have already bestowed her as a free gift. She belongs to you. 
Therefore, it is not necessary to ask our leave to take her away. Already she has told you that she hopes to accompany you and to remain your servant for as long as you will be willing to endure her presence. We are only too happy to know that you deign to accept her, and we pray that you will not trouble yourself on our account. In this place, we could not provide her with proper clothing, much less with a dowry. Moreover, being old, we should in any event have to separate from her before long. Therefore, it is very fortunate that you should be willing to take her with you now. It was in vain that Tomotada tried to persuade the old people to accept a present. He found that they cared nothing for money. But he saw that they were really anxious to trust their daughter's fate to his hands, and he therefore decided to take her with him. So he placed her upon his horse and bade the old folks farewell for the time being with many sincere expressions of gratitude. Honored sir, the father made answer, it is we, not you, who have reason for gratitude. We are sure that you will be kind to our girl, and we have no fears for her sake. Here in the Japanese original, there is a queer break in the natural course of the narration, which therefrom remains curiously inconsistent. Nothing further is said about the mother of Tomotada, or about the parents of Aoyagi, or about the daimyo of Noto. Evidently, the writer wearied of his work at this point and hurried the story very carelessly to its startling end. I am not able to supply his omissions or to repair his faults of construction, but I must venture to put in a few explanatory details, without which the rest of the tale would not hold together. It appears that Tomotada rashly took Ayoyagi with him to Kyoto, and so got into trouble, but we are not informed as to where the couple lived afterwards. Now, a samurai was not allowed to marry without the consent of his lord, and Tomotada could not expect to obtain this sanction before his mission had been accomplished. He had reason, under such circumstances, to fear that the beauty of Ayoyagi might attract dangerous attention and that means might be devised of taking her away from him. In Kyoto, he therefore tried to keep her hidden from curious eyes. But a retainer of Lord Hosokawa one day caught sight of Ayoyagi, discovered her relation to Tomotada, and reported the matter to the daimyo. Thereupon the daimyo, a young prince and fond of pretty faces, gave orders that the girl should be brought to the palace at once, and she was taken thither without ceremony. Tomotada sorrowed unspeakably, but he knew himself powerless. He was only a humble messenger in the service of a far-off daimyo, and for the time being he was at the mercy of a much more powerful daimyo, whose wishes were not to be questioned. Moreover, Tomotada knew that he had acted foolishly, that he had brought about his own misfortune by entering into a clandestine relation which the code of the military class condemned. There was now but one hope for him, a desperate hope that Ayoyagi might be able and willing to escape and to flee with him. After a long reflection, he resolved to try to send her a letter. The attempt might be dangerous, of course. Any writing sent to her might find its way to the hands of the daimyo, and to send a love letter to any inmate of the palace was an unpardonable offense. But he resolved to dare the risk, and, in the form of a Chinese poem, he composed a letter which he endeavored to have conveyed to her. The poem was written with only 28 characters, but with those 28 characters, he was able to express all the depth of his passion and to suggest all the pain of his loss. Koshi Oson Gojin wo u, Ryukuji Namida wo tarate, Tarati Raken wo Hita Taru. Komon hitotabi, irite fukaki koto umi no gotoshi, kori yore shoro kore rojin. Closely, closely, the youthful prince now follows after the gem bright maid. The tears of the fair one falling have moistened all her robes. But the august lord, having once become enamored of her, the depth of his longing is like the depth of the sea. Therefore, it is only I that am left forlorn, only I that am left to wander along. 
On the evening of the day after this poem had been sent, Tomotada was summoned to appear before the Lord Hosokawa. The youth at once suspected that his confidence had been betrayed, and he could not hope, if his letter had been seen by the daimyo, to escape the severest penalty. Now he will order my death, thought Tomotada, but I do not care to live unless Ayoyagi be restored to me. Besides, if the death sentence be passed, I can at least try to kill Hosokawa. He slipped his swords into his girdle and hastened to the palace. Upon entering the presentation room, he saw the Lord Hosokawa seated upon the dais, surrounded by samurai of high rank, in caps and robes of ceremony. All were silent as statues, and while Tomotada advanced to make obeisance, the hush seemed to him sinister and heavy, like the stillness before a storm. But Hosokawa suddenly descended from the dais, and, while taking the youth by the arm, began to repeat the words of the poem, Koshi Osan Goju Wou. And Tomotada, looking up, saw kindly tears in the prince's eyes. Then said Hosokawa, Because you love each other so much, I have taken it upon myself to authorize your marriage, in lieu of my kinsman, the Lord of Noto, and your wedding shall now be celebrated before me. The guests are assembled, the gifts are ready. At a signal from the Lord, the sliding screens concealing a further apartment were pushed open, and Tomotada saw many dignitaries of the court assembled for the ceremony, and Aoyagi awaiting him in bride's apparel. Thus she was given back to him, and the wedding was joyous and splendid, and precious gifts were made to the young couple by the prince and by the members of his household. For five happy years after that wedding, Tomotada and Aoyagi dwelt together. But one morning, Aoyagi, while talking with her husband about some household matter, suddenly uttered a great cry of pain, and then became very white and still. After a few moments, she said, in a feeble voice, Pardon me thus, rudely crying out, but the pain was so sudden. My dear husband, our union must have been brought about through some karma relation in a former state of existence, and that happy relation, I think, will bring us again together in more than one life to come. But for this present existence of ours, the relation is now ended. We are about to be separated. Repeat for me, I beseech you, the Nembutsu prayer, because I am dying. Oh, what strange wild fancies, cried the startled husband. You are only a little unwell, my dear one. Lie down for a while and rest, and the sickness will pass. No, no, she responded. I am dying. I do not imagine it. I know. And it were needless now, my dear husband, to hide the truth from you any longer. I am not a human being. The soul of a tree is my soul. The heart of a tree is my heart. The sap of the willow is my life. And someone at this cruel moment is cutting down my tree, and that is why I must die. Even to weep were now beyond my strength. Quickly, quickly, repeat the Nembutsu for me. Quickly. Ah! With another cry of pain, she turned aside her beautiful head and tried to hide her face behind her sleeve. But almost in the same moment, her whole form appeared to collapse in the strangest way and to sink down, 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 level with the floor. Tomotada had sprung to support her, but there was nothing to support. There lay on the matting only the empty robes of the fair creature and the ornaments that she had worn in her hair. The body had ceased to exist. Tomotada shaved his head, took the Buddhist vows, and became an itinerant priest. He traveled through all the provinces of the empire, and at holy places which he visited, he offered up prayers for the soul of Ayoyagi. Reaching Ikazen in the course of his pilgrimage, he sought the home of the parents of his beloved. But when he arrived at the lonely place among the hills where their dwelling had been, he found that the cottage had disappeared. There was nothing to mark even the spot where it had stood, 
except the stumps of three willows, two old trees and one young tree that had been cut down long before his arrival. Beside the stumps of those willow trees he erected a memorial tomb, inscribed with holy texts, and he there performed many Buddhist services on behalf of the spirits of Aoyagi and of her parents. I'm Super Antonio. Thanks for listening. I appreciate your views. Like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell, and we shall meet again. In the next deep dive.